Nursing is a role we've all relied upon at some point in our lives. But what is it really like to be a nurse? And what can we learn from this? Take a journey into the world and culture of nursing with resilience and nurse coach Eva Storey. Eva tells about her 36 years as a nurse in a variety of countries across the world, sharing fascinating stories from her journey and the challenges of the role. However, it is the insights into the nature of the culture and the pervading operating paradigms of nursing that really set the context for the need for her new phase of her career as a coach within nursing, something that is very new in this field. Eva talks about the need to put self-care first in order to provide sustainable quality care to others, creating a safe space to explore different, more human conversations, as well as how to coach resilience in such a demanding role. Care has many faces beyond the traditional views many of us carry, and this conversation with Eva, who cares so deeply for others, particularly her fellow nurses, provides many clear and focused examples for anyone to implement in their own lives. So enjoy, Eva. Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. Nursing, the role and job we all rely on often when we or our loved ones are not quite at our strongest is where we're going today with my guest, Eva Story. Eva, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you, Bryn. So I always like to start off by understanding how people end up where they are in terms of here in Western Australia, mm-hmm. whether born or come, come, you know, how they got here. Um, you came in 2014, is that correct? That's right, yes. Why was that? Well, long story really. Um, my husband is an Australian citizen and I've been married before, so Steve is my second partner, if you like, second husband. And um, I'd always had a dream to come to Australia when I was much younger, so in my early 20s qualified as a nurse and at that time Australia was crying out for nurses and it was always kind of that dream to come here and Mm. experience life. Um, My first first husband didn't want to go there, didn't want to entertain the thought, didn't like the heat so it kind of got parked for quite a number of years. Um, Fast forward into my 40s and kind of a divorce and two children later and I met Steve my husband now who is an Australian citizen and I met him through online dating (laughs) which is a story in itself but I'll stick with the Australia (laughs) bit so and we when we first got together we were chatting about you know kind of the dreams that we had and the things that we wanted to do and I talked about always having this dream of wanting to go to Australia and I didn't know at that time that he was actually an Australian citizen and we were chatting and he said oh hang on just wait a minute disappeared upstairs came back down and he said I've got something to show you so I think that's a bit strange anyway Mm. produces this Australian. This wasn't on the first date, was no, it? No, 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 <laughs> no. Produces this Australian passport. And I was like, oh my God. He said, I'm an Australian citizen. And he said, I have always wanted to go back and live in Australia. His parents were £10 poms, as they were known, um, came out to Adelaide. And his mum never settled in Adelaide. So they went back when Steve, my husband, was six. Right. So <laughs> it was kind of a weird set of circumstances, yeah. really, for yeah, want yeah, of a yeah. better way of putting it. The um, universe sort of gave yeah, you something. Yeah. And we talked about, kind of resurrected those dreams a bit, really. And my eldest daughter at the time was living here in Perth. Um, so we had connections to Perth. And then a series of... Um, life changes happened in that Steve lost his job he was a pilot in the UK lost his job and we ended up going to live in the Middle East because that was the only place that was recruiting yeah so my other daughter who was probably about 17 at the time um was living in the UK so I had one daughter in Perth and one daughter in the UK and it was a bit of a, do we go and live in the Middle East, leaving her really pretty much to her own devices. She'd obviously live in my house. 
she was up for that. I was a bit more yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as you as you would be as a parent. Anyway, we kind of talked about it and said, look, you know, if, if we're serious about going to live in Australia, it's kind of a bit of a halfway point. So we can go live in the Middle East. It's not too far to get back should we need to get back. Um, and that's what we did. So we lived in the Middle East for three years. I had connections with Perth. I'd been backwards and forwards to see my daughter and she'd said to me, hey, mum, they're building this new hospital in Perth. You should have a look, website, see if the jobs, what jobs are going. Mm. That would be Fiona Stanley. It was Fiona Stanley. Yeah. Not so... just any hospital. <laughs> <laughs> no. So I went on the website and there was this expression of interest. Um, so I filled the form in and really kind of didn't think much more of it filled it in didn't hear anything knew that it wasn't completed and there was all the political stuff going on in the background and then one day in my inbox appeared this email with a whole list of senior nursing jobs so I kind of looked at the list and I kind of mentally going through it thinking well don't necessarily have the skills for that but there was one that kind of stood out that matched with my experience which was the nurse director for the state rehab um, service so I filled in this application form in the Middle East um, sent it off and didn't hear anything for a while and then again got an email to say you've been accepted for an interview (laughs) which I'm laughing because it was the weirdest interview I'd ever had in my life for lots of bizarre reasons. Mm. So imagine the scenario in the Middle East, it, you know, trying to find somewhere that had video conferencing facilities. Um, I had to give a presentation, so it wasn't an option to fly here to have the interview. The interviews were done remotely yeah. via Skype. I couldn't couldn't use the facilities at work for obvious reasons I'm like how am I going to do this how am I going to find somewhere that has the facility for me to do a presentation be interviewed in a city that I didn't really know no where those about. facilities yeah. existed sorry um and then somebody one of our friends said oh well there's a hotel down the road I'm sure they do business conferences so tipped up there and said you know this is this is what I'm trying to do can you help me and a very helpful person said oh we've got business suite yeah we can we can sort that out for you so long story short um I had this interview in this big conference room in Doha in the (laughs) middle of summer in the boiling hot weather And what the people who interviewed me didn't realise was at the back of the room was this little Indian guy who I made promise he wouldn't leave me because I thought if the technology fails, Fails. I wouldn't know what to do. Yeah. Um, And it was just bizarre. I think I was more nervous about the technology than I was about the interview. Anyway, I got offered the job and that's how I Mm. came to... Perth in Western Australia yeah. and you're, you've been here now five years it'll be six years in February yeah yeah is it home um yes and no um, family are in the UK both got aging parents my grandchildren are in the UK which is a little bit got a difficult <laughs> yeah young very young um, there's five weeks between the two boys and they're both one. One's one next week and the other one's one in December. So I do spend quite a lot of time going backwards and forwards. Yeah. So nursing's been very much your work game focus. Yeah. yeah. All of it. 36 odd yeah. years. Yeah. Um, you are now a coach of nurses. And we'll get into yeah. that in yeah. a minute. Tell me, you know, you said to me before in in the questionnaire I asked you to fill out, you know, nursing had been the thing you wanted to do for as long as you could remember. Mm. What was that? I I really don't know where that came from. Genuinely, I have nobody in the family who was right. So there's no nursing. So there's no like a, 
lineage of no, mum, no, grand, grandmother. No, nobody. I was the first person in kind of generations to to want to be a nurse. Um, and I don't, I don't genuinely. I was thinking about that when I was filling the question questionnaire, and I don't know where that came from. Mm. Um, I can remember it it being something that if anybody ever asked me when I was young that was what I would say I wanted to do right um caused a bit of conflict sometimes with my dad because my dad used to say oh no you need to go into a proper profession you need to be a doctor (laughs) and I was like I knew I didn't want to be a doctor because I was you know that wasn't that wasn't part of my plan um so yeah I, I genuinely don't know where that came from but I always knew that was what I wanted to do. Was there, could you visualise yourself doing something? Was there a feeling around it? Could you see an impact you were going to have? Not at that young age. No, no. I just knew that was something what I wanted to do. And that was kind of what, all the way through school, you know, that was, that in was my head, that was what I was going to do. I never thought that I would do anything else. I never wanted to do anything mm. else. Um... I didn't do very well at school. I struggled and failed most of my. You remember O levels? GCSEs. <laughs> oh, GCSEs. Just after them. <laughs> so I failed most of mine, which was devastating because at that time you had to have at least five to get into nursing, and you had to have maths and you had to have science, both of which I failed. Right. So I had to resit most of my exams. Yeah. Um, stayed on another two years into sixth form pretty much to repeat exams because I knew if I didn't I couldn't get into nursing um yeah so that was kind of how Mm. I arrived um got past my exams at the second attempt and again kind of my family wanted me to go to London to St Parts and I didn't want to do that I've always had a very clear this is what I want to do um, and I had a friend who was in Leeds who was six months kind of ahead of me and she used to ring me up and say oh you've got to come to Leeds it's fantastic training's really good I'm having a ball you know make sure you apply yeah. to Leeds so she inspired me really I said yeah. oh it sounds great I want to go there so I applied and got offered a place so mm. I did did my training in Jimmy's in Leeds which back then was quite famous yeah I don't know if you remember um they did a whole documentary about jimmy's and the characters and yes. yeah so yeah so obviously we're not going to go through full 36 years no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> to take too long <laughs> We'd be a give me an overview of your of your journey and not just the jobs that you've done but how you progressed Mm. a bit of a strange journey really Um, and I guess the best way to describe it is opportunities found me rather than me finding them if that makes sense so most of the roles that I've had in nursing have been a bit what I would call wacky and different so usually around new innovatives so things like day surgery in the UK was something that I ended up working in and it was literally a call for nurses to work in a new unit that was opening and because at that time they were struggling to recruit nurses they they, there was an opportunity to be trained as a theatre nurse an anaesthetic nurse and a recovery nurse as well as working on the ward so essentially you ended up with all these different skills trained but in a very short period of time Mm. Um, and a lot of my the things that I've done when I look back I haven't kind of followed the same specialism if you like I've kind of jumped around and gone into different things yes but that's kind of been because opportunities have come my way and I've kind of thought actually I could have a go at that yeah so 
if I reflect back on all of those experiences, if someone was to look at my CV, they would think it's kind of a bit of a mishmash of lots of things. But It makes sense to you. It makes sense to me, and I've always taken away things from every job that I've had. So kind of a bit of a personal, um, not rule, rule's not the right word, um, personal approach I always think I never go back to a job. Yes. I never go back to doing something that I've done. I always go forward to something. Because I think you learn from every experience and every job you've mm. ever had and you take that with you into the next job. But to go back to something you've done is almost, to me anyway, like a backward step. Yes. So I kind of worked in day surgery. I've um, worked in the community as a district nurse uh, I've worked on big government projects so an example of that was um, in Manchester City Centre we had this initiative to bring um, healthcare make it more accessible to people so part of the work I was doing was involved with procurement um, going out to tender, working with private partnerships. So there was a very well-known um, pharmaceutical company in the UK who were very keen to step into that space. And a yeah. lot of the work that I did was negotiating and liaising and yeah. coming up with something that would work where we could have a GP surgery based in the centre of Manchester. So... I'd kind of acquired all these different skills um, and then I think when my husband got the job in the Middle East I was like oh, I don't really want to go to the Middle East and not work I want to be able to mm. experience a different country a different culture and at that time I didn't know that that was going to be possible to do mm. and then again came across an advert in the nursing times that was looking for senior nurses in Doha applied for the job, was interviewed in London, got offered this job as a director of nursing, managing um, quite a big service that visited Qatari nationals in their own home. So it was like a, a bit like a district nursing service, yes. but a different kind of cultural um, circumstances. And I think when I look at that now, that role probably was what started to shape some of my leadership skills so the combination of everything I'd done before mm. plus being exposed to something that was very different a lot, a, a lot of people don't realize when you work in the Middle East there's there's two sets of what I call HR processes so they have one set for everybody who comes to work there and they have one set of rules for people who are born there who are nationals right so you continually having to play between the two mm. rules which can be really challenging yes um and i think that role particularly for me honed a lot of those leadership skills and being able to talk to people there's a lot of fear around what you could and couldn't say and if oh, if you say that you you'll be sent home they'll fire you yes and a lot of what I did in that role was educating people how you could have that difficult conversation without um, landing in hot water. You yes. know, there's ways of doing it. And it, I think one of the biggest takeaways for me was kind of my capacity to be able to share what I'd learnt with other people that they then could share. And that kind of started that whole ball rolling so by the time I got here, um, I kind of, I was the last person to be recruited to the first service that was opening. So I literally had six months before the service opened and they were transitioning the old Shenton Park cam campus nursing staff, lock, stock and barrel to the new state rehab service. And there were multiple, multiple challenges in there. The whole mm. kind of change process had been quite difficult for a lot of those staff. So there was a fair bit of negativity about not wanting to work there and change and having to learn oh, yes. all these new skills. You can imagine the, 
there was a quite a depth of feeling around that mm. and by the time I arrived of course I had been recruited internationally so I didn't know who I was and I can always remember in my first week one of the senior nurses asking me this very complicated complex rehabilitation question and this is it in front of this group of senior nurses who were who were going to be managing this new um, state rehab service and I just said uh, I said well I don't know the answer to that I was shock horror but you're the nurse director and you, you don't know the answer I said but no that that's not my role my role is to manage the change and to support you you're the rehab experts you have that expertise not me mm. and it was almost that you know when you take a new job sometimes and and there's a fair bit of testing you out and mm. seeing and I, mm. it was a quite a challenge though those first few weeks and spent a lot a lot of time working with them developing them letting them shadow learning skills but a hugely, hugely rewarding job, hugely rewarding. So did that for four years um, and to see them grow and to see their achievements in learning things that they'd previously either never been allowed to learn because yeah. they weren't senior enough or they had never had a mechanism for people to... Um, bring ideas and test things out and try things within the confines of obviously being safe but they've never yeah. never been allowed to do that so I think having a different approach and somebody that facilitated that they literally just lit up yeah and you know for me that was it's not about the status or the title at all it's about that you know seeing people grow seeing them develop as leaders in their own right to me was what what really made that role mm. and that's I guess where my passion comes from about leadership and I you know as you would imagine as a senior nurse you meet lots of people in leadership roles and there's there's often a lot of power play in those roles whereas I think to be I was be, going to ask what what is the culture of nursing like I think nursing has you know, I'm yeah. a complete outsider yeah um, yet in the very small veneer of what I've been made aware of it it would strike me as being quite hierarchical yeah um, and it's also set within quite a huge bludgeoning system which mm. is the health system mm. and then there's the dynamic I can only imagine of nurses and doctors which have yeah should yeah. have complementary but very yeah. different yeah roles and I'm sure there's other dynamics to it which there, there are there are a lot of dynamics in nursing and I think if you you have to kind of go back to the history of nursing to understand the journey and where nursing is now so predominantly nursing has and continues to be mainly a, a female dominated <clears throat> profession although I think there are more men coming into nursing mm. than than ever which is great <coughs> and I think nurses who trained way back when so my training was in the 80s mm. um, was very rigid you didn't necessarily step out of line you certainly didn't question someone in authority and you definitely didn't question someone who was a, a doctor you followed orders and that was pretty yeah. much how you were trained um, nursing has changed a lot for the better I think but you've kind of got it's really interesting because I was reading something about the different generational differences in nursing so the generation x yeah. y millennials and how how 
how the different generations expect different things from nursing. Yeah. So you've kind of got a mixture of all these different generational approaches. But within that, the biggest group of nursing is probably the baby boomer years. So you've yes. got a big cohort of nurses who are kind of late 40s, late 50s in yes. nursing who... They're the predominant demographic. Yeah, and yeah. may not have always had um, opportunities in terms of leadership development and management development. So mm. you've kind of got this strange mix of um, kind of, I want to say old versus new. Yeah. And I think certainly... I can imagine if, if like you said, it, it come from this very regimented background. Yeah. And that, that stuff will get ingrained mm. early on. Mm. And then if the larger demographic is of that training yeah. that's going to be the pervading yeah. culture for quite yeah. some time and I think not that I want to paint a, a really bleak picture of nursing because I don't but I think what you've touched on you know there is a lot of evidence to say that there is bullying in nursing right you know some of our grad students um, struggle with unhelpful approaches when they're trying to learn mm. but I think fundamentally for me what's missing in that space is how you have a difficult conversation so if somebody is not very nice to a grad on a ward mm. as a nurse manager as as the leader for that ward it's your responsibility mm. to have that conversation and to in a way that's constructive but gives somebody feedback because that's invariably what doesn't happen so it's perpetuated that? that having that difficult conversation, saying to someone, hey, you know, that wasn't a helpful discussion or a helpful way of communicating with that nurse. It's... Oh, so that stuff just gets left. Well, it or just perpetuates because yeah. it, no one will tackle it. Nobody wants well, to go yeah. there. Yeah, and this is... This... Yeah. Nursing's not alone in this, no. but I imagine it's quite a hotbed for it. Whereby, yeah, you know... You, You'll have, you'll have a friend in a friend group yeah. who's got something yeah. that just rubs everyone up the wrong yeah. way and everybody accepts it and yeah. goes down the path of least resistance because, oh, I can't be asked. You know, but that then becomes tacit approval that this behaviour yeah. is acceptable. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, that's... It. So if you think about a grad in that situation, that's very challenging quite often for somebody who's newly qualified or who's even a, a student mm. being able to challenge that on on a personal level when you're dependent mm. on somebody signing off to say you're proficient at a task you don't always want to stick your head above the parapet, parapet yeah. so I think it's fair to say that there has been mm. a culture of that in nursing I think Mm. No, it's, uh, the other thing that pops up for me is I can understand how you know, that initial firm and clear feedback is important because mm. you know, people's lives are at stake. You know, I find having worked in a corporate environment for a while, you know, people's lives are generally not at stake. Mm. So then you get mm. a lot of it gets watered down into, you know, oh, you know, you know and you just let things float along. So, you know, where is that balance between, yeah, sometimes you're going to get some hard feedback. Mm. And it's not always... Up, up front on your performance. Yeah. And the whole um, being a bit delicate. Mm. And it's not just nursing. It's, mm. you know, that those um, scenarios happen in the medical profession. They happen, you know, kind of doctor to nurse relationship sometimes but I think there's there's a lot more awareness about that and there's mm. certainly a lot more work being done around you know healthy communications in teams and working together and kind of um, people having access to opportunities around learning those skills and shadowing and mentoring much more than there ever was which are great ways of helping people to see there's there's often different ways of doing it, but I think it has suffered very much um, mm. from, yeah, cultural issues in nursing. Mm. And I guess, yeah, 
But I guess we, the patient, would we see and notice that? Or I'd like to say no. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think one of the biggest things for me as a nurse was, and still is, the ability to listen to patients because patients are vulnerable when they're in hospital and nursing skills make a massive difference to that vulnerability. So if you have an issue on a team that's playing out with your team, that is in some way, shape or form going to impact, maybe not so obviously, but potentially. And the other factor there is if you have a team that isn't cohesive and communication isn't great, then the sharing of information that needs to be shared. So if you you know, if you think about nursing as being the eyes and ears of the patient on the ward, they yeah. tend to pick up if something's going wrong. Whereas if you've got an issue within a team and the communication's not great, that that important aspect of that care may not be being communicated and there's risks around that. So it's in everybody's best interests in healthcare to have good teamwork and good communication for that very reason that you do need to be able to communicate and say when something's not right so the personal dynamics can and I have seen that happen Mm. in some instances and I think as a leader that's very much part of the role is modeling the behavior that you want your staff to follow and having that open dialogue and communication and a, a lot of a lot of what I did was almost I suppose, I suppose it coaching is the word I would use people shadowed so yeah you know having a difficult conversation I I had senior nurses who've said you know come and knocked on the door and said I don't know how to do that I've only ever done performance development and ticked all the boxes do the because do. I don't know how how to do it a lot of people perhaps might dismiss that but to me if somebody's brave enough to say hey I don't know how to do this yeah then I have a responsibility to help that person to learn those skills and if that's by shadowing by observing you know that that's Mm. hugely important and part of part of the role that I had was spending a lot of time doing that helping people to acquire those skills because if we don't do that, we're condoning often mm. behaviour that actually isn't helpful yeah. to teams or patients, you know? And I suppose thinking about it, there's, there's a large amount of yeah, performance te- technical execution of the job yeah. as opposed to the whole cohesive and nature of it. And, and I think, a, sorry, d- yeah, perf- performance as well, kind of... This, to me, is the difference if you look at how performance is done outside of nursing. Um, Nursing performance has tended to be very much a tick box, so if you haven't had your performance review, you you don't get the next incremental level in pay. So there's almost a negative correlation there between having a difficult conversation and giving someone constructive feedback to say, actually, you know, you're not meeting the mark for your next increment. A lot of people wouldn't go there for that reason. So they just take them off. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So the way that performance has been, um, development has been managed in the past has not always been a great thing. And I think the other thing is there's misunderstandings about what that process is for. And some nurses' experience of performance has been negative. So it's been used as a kind of opportunity to um, talk about poor performance, which is a totally different process when you're talking about performance review. It's, Mm. you know, where are you? Where are your development needs? What do you need? How can I help you? Whereas some of the experience of nurses has not been that. It's been about you know, a specific poor performance issue. Yeah, you're not which, good at that. You're not so there's, at that. there's some negativity around that whole mm. performance issues. And, I, you know, those things are changing, mm. changing for the better, but that hasn't always helped when you need to, you know, give constructive feedback to somebody to say, 
that's not how to do it, you know. So a large rub of this is giving constructive feedback. Yeah. And it's, there's that saying, isn't it? The behaviour that you walk past is the behaviour that's condemned, I think it is. Yeah. And, you know, that's so true as a leader. If you see something and you don't act Mm. on that, you don't say something, Mm. you are condoning it. And and that kind of comes back to the testing you out bit because if people see that you don't condone it then it, it shifts that relationship dynamic. yeah and that dynamic oh, that person has boundaries yeah 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 they have acceptables yeah. and not acceptables yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. very much so so i've had a number of coaches in different areas mm. and fields on the podcast and one of the things i find is there's always by and large a, a, tipping point where somebody goes right sod it I'm going to go coach people on this so is that the same for you not necessarily no Um, what brought me into coaching was a change in my employment circumstances Mm. so fast forward kind of been in the role for I think it was four years and big financial restructure and my position went in the restructure and I kind of knew what was coming over the hill, um, but I don't think I'd anticipated the impact that that had on me psychologically. Yeah. So in health, there's this weird situation where a position can go and you're told as, as a redeployee um, that you will be found meaningful work which is a horrible term. <laughs> it's an awful, awful term. Essentially what that means is that your position has gone, but you will be found work within the organisation in a role that's meaningful to you. But it, yeah. Yeah. They need, need to change the language around that. Yeah, for sure. Um, and as you've probably gathered, I've always had a clear kind of, this is what I want to do. And for me, that was a real kind of, shock to the system to find myself suddenly out of a role that I'd loved that I'd invested quite a lot in developing other people to being at sea not knowing what I was going to be doing Mm. and wanting to have some control over that not wanting someone else to decide Mm -hmm. my destiny if you like which sounds dramatic but that's Mm. where I was at at that point in time and there are also quite negative connotations around being a redeployer, which I didn't realise at the time. Mm. So redeployment um, can be viewed as, well, somebody's not performed in their job, so they've been redeployed. Ah. So it can have, not always, but can have negative connotations. And I had started to apply for lots of different jobs outside of, um, the hospital and wasn't getting anywhere sometimes wasn't getting shortlisted sometimes was being interviewed and then not being offered the position and that was the first time that had ever happened to me I've mm. never been in the position where I've had to apply multiple times for jobs so I've, I've applied for jobs and not got them and that's fine use the feedback and you learn from that but I had never been in a position where I'd been repeatedly applying for jobs and not getting anywhere and I realised I was kind of I really did go through quite a not a very good place because that that whole um, mindset starts to creep in as you know perhaps you're too old perhaps you don't have this you don't have that that horrible negative self-talk mm. really kind of caught me out yeah. and fell into that hole of and, and nursing's been your thing and yeah yeah you've been doing yeah, it and yeah. it's very yeah. much part of who Eva yeah. is very very much part of my identity and I found myself in not a very good space and I hadn't had particularly good advice either at the time so I was really at sea thinking what the hell am I going to do what where am I going to go what what am I going to do next and 
I kind of came across as things happen um, this advert for a life coaching course mm. and it was like fill in this assessment and see if you you know you're suitable and I did and it came back and told me I was highly suitable and I kind of sat and thought about it and I thought a lot of people when I was in my role as nurse director would come and find me mm. informally and kind of come and have a chat with you and I that happened a lot people would come and seek me out I didn't go looking for them they would come to me and so many people used to say you you give such good advice when you know people came and had a chat and it made me think maybe there's something in this maybe yeah. you know reflecting on that maybe I can still do some of what I love in a different way and it was also around that time that I had the opportunity to be coached myself and I'd never been coached right. and I was quite skeptical about being coached I didn't really mm. understand a lot about it and I went along to this session it was actually a free session and I was kind of really not sure what to make of it but thought hey nothing to lose if it helps you know it helps and the person sorry sorry I'm supposed to turn this off oh, stop, stop, stop. live broadcasting sorry That's I all don't right. know what's happened there I shouldn't have done that anyway um Yeah, so I, w I went along to this coaching session and I think I must have come across as quite negative. In fact, I know I came across as, you know, doom and gloom and life's not fair. And and this person really gave me quite a hard time. And I was like, shit. You know, yeah. I wasn't, ex I was expecting, I suppose, sympathy. Yeah. And I didn't get it. I got somebody who challenged all of those things that I said and was quite hard actually with me and I kind of thought I never thought about things that way and just highlighted really well what could you do you know you've got all these opportunities now you've got all this experience you've got all these skills what can you do what are you going to do and it really uh, the expression rabbit in headlights yes you know it was and I think at that point, I realised how much of a hole I'd fallen into mm. and how much that negative self-talk had actually so affected me. that hole was me. related to the end Losing, of your job and yeah, not yeah. getting other work straight away. And I came out of that session thinking, I actually can do something here. I can. Mm. There's possibilities, you know, and I guess it created a shift in my thinking. And that's really what took me on that journey to study to become a life coach and and what's really interesting for me is a part of at the beginning of that course we had to do quite a few exercises and one of them was you know how well do you listen and of course being a nurse you like to think you listen really well um but i actually discovered i didn't listen as well as i thought i did right because there's different levels of listening and and to be a coach you have to listen you know intentionally you have to you're not just listening to the words you're listening to the tone you're listening to breathing you're mm. listening for shifts in energy and I've learned so much through studying coaching that for me because it had such a powerful impact on me it kind of made me think more people should have access to this mm. so coaching as i'm sure you're aware is or has sat very much in the executive space mm. whereas the probably the people who need coaching are the people i call in the middle section so these are the the managers who maybe don't know how to have those difficult conversations mm. or you know, helping someone to achieve maybe some of their own personal goals, which ultimately has an impact then back in the workplace. Because from a nursing point of view, 
what I didn't say before is quite often when there is a performance issue there's a reason underneath that and invariably it's not always a work reason it's something that's going on at home or it's yeah. something that's happening in the family personal reasons that that person has no outlet and ends up behaving in a certain way at work Blowing because they're, at work, they're yeah. trying to deal with something challenging in the personal life and whilst coaching isn't therapy absolutely isn't therapy what coaching can do is help people to really give them the space and the time to perhaps talk about things that they've never had the opportunity to talk about and that for me is the real value of coaching say things out loud they wouldn't normally yeah and I, I, I absolutely find it so rewarding to see that journey so I you know people come to me and it's they'll come with a goal and invariably we'll work on that and then where it ends up quite often isn't where we've started because they've discovered things along the way Mm. that actually the end point is different to where they thought they want to go but and sometimes I find that the goal that is easily articulated certainly at the start of a goal setting process is the end of like 10 or 15 thought processes. Yes. Yeah. And if you do dive all the way back down yeah. in there, it's like, oh, so you yeah. actually want to feel more at ease in your yeah. job, more self-esteem yeah. in your role. And, sort of, you know. and sometimes it can be the first opportunity that someone's had to mm. ever explore those things. So it, come back to the dream of going to Australia. You know, for some people, they might have, a dream buried here somewhere that they've never ever shared with anybody yes and to have that opportunity to say hey well if this is something you really want if this is a goal how are we going to mm. get you to that goal so that's that was really how I ended up in, mm. in coaching because I think I experienced it myself and it had such a profound effect on mm. me and you know, I, I want to be able to facilitate that for other people so that they have opportunities to achieve some of the things they want to achieve. And, you know, I, there's all manner of things that people bring to coaching. But for me, that's where the gap is in nursing mm. around. It, I'm going to assume here, I'll check in with it. I assume coaching's not. A readily available thing in nursing. Um, no, not not for the level of nurses at the nurse unit manager or midwife manager level. So executive nurses tend to have some access yeah. to it, and there are some organisations. So the Australian College of Nursing has um, opportunities for sessions for students as part of their... Oh, right, um, so it's like the top end of the bottom. Yeah, end. yeah, but there's that whole section in the middle hmm. that don't, or haven't traditionally had access to coaching. Is um, that your target market? Yeah, yeah, because I can see the difference it can make, and it, hmm. my focus really in working with nurses is around resilience. Yeah. So resilience is something that you can learn to develop, over time but you you need to have an awareness and an understanding of how to do that and because nursing is such a emotionally intense role yes the biggest issue that I hear from nurses that I coach is time they don't have time for themselves and they don't have time for self-care so we're very good at telling patients how to look after yes. themselves we're not very good at telling ourselves how yes. to look after ourselves and it's quite correct me if I'm drawing on a touch of stereotype here but it would be quite easy for a female orientated industry mm. where you know if I look at the females in my life they're very good at putting everybody else yeah. first Yeah. and so that coupled with being in a caring putting everyone else first role 
Is it you, your development, let alone having somebody hold a space for you to explore opportunities yeah. and possibilities is, is quite a low down on the list. Absolutely, and, and I think that's the biggest, the biggest factor that comes through, you know, the nurses recognise that, mm. but actually being able to sit down to and work action, with someone and say, okay, how, how are we going to bring back time for you in mm. here? Because if you have to be resilient which you do as a nurse yeah the one thing that depletes that is when you're under stress and your self-care mm. falls off the plate then you your resilience mm. starts to slip and what does when you say resilience what does resilience mean in the in the nursing context it's the capacity to be able to manage stress in right. a stressful situation so healthcare the pace in healthcare the turnover of patients on a ward and the demands of the job are really high yes and that produces stress mm. so if you have a high stress environment how how you cope with that some people are better at coping than others mm -hmm. some people become workaholics so they functioning workaholics yeah, yeah they come in early they stay late they look at emails at home so the family life suffers the children don't often get that much meaningful contact so yes is that word meaningful again yeah <laughs> resilience is made up of lots of different components so self-care is one um networks support networks is another there's there's different aspects that help somebody to be resilient or not and i think mm. the other thing to say is you're not born resilient yes so some people are better at being resilient than others but you can learn to be resilient yeah. and it changes. So you can be fine, as in my case, I was fine. And then something Frages, happens yeah. and it knocks you yeah. resilient. Complete left field. Yeah. So it's my interest and my passion is working with nurses mm. on being able to understand how to manage that rather than it getting to the point where someone's completely stressed out and they're off work with stress. You know that that's too late to be able to work with people at this point. So yeah, you're in damage awareness. control yeah. then. Yeah, yeah. Um, so thinking this through, this must be quite challenging. From a if, if this is a service you're going out into the world yeah. to offer and therefore make your living from. Yeah. Um, this must be quite challenging from a marketing perspective. Yes. <laughs> um, because coaching and nursing, as you said, is, is, is not a widely no, recognized no. thing, particularly at the tier level yeah. that you're looking at, yeah. your target market. You've got the whole uh, systemic stuff going on, the cultural stuff. You've got the, the thing we just talked about, mm. about putting yourself last mm. and all of that. So even to get someone to even consider the concept, let alone sign up, and we'll talk about that in a minute. How do you go about that? Well, that's a really good question because that's been part of my learning journey and as I'm sure you're aware, kind of anybody starting out, particularly with a, an online business, which is primarily what mine is, is yeah. I offer coaching through a website. That's where I started this journey. Mm. And it's, Your reach is global? Yes, it's not yeah. just limited to Australia, but... You know, my, my learnings, having never run a business before and had to learn all the whole marketing side of how you do this, then the digital side of it, so all the tools and the ways yeah. that people, you know, advise you to do it. And, you know, it, if you look at Facebook, you're absolutely bombarded with sign up for this and I'll give you the secret formula to achieving, oh, yeah. you know. And You've only got to show half an interest in wanting to become an entrepreneur and then yeah. that's it, your Facebook feed is yeah. peppered. But what I have learnt and I've really kind of, I have read a lot around because I actually my own journey with this marketing some some of the things i've actually thought you know what that would really annoy me if somebody was almost i'm not saying i've done this but bombarding someone with emails you're almost pleading with someone to be a client and that to me that's yeah that doesn't sit 
quite right and I think for nursing it's about cultivating an awareness mm. so how can coaching help me as a nurse yes and no, we're not even selling either at this point no 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 so to me it's going to take time to grow that gradually and it mm. will come from word of mouth so people who have been coached by me who have been through that process and can talk to someone else about the benefits for them mm. is one way that that can be done which is incrementally yes so i'm not going to have thousands of clients overnight and that's that to be honest is not what this is about it's about having something that's meaningful and yes. that's word of mouth almost um is one aspect the other aspect is around educating people so a lot of what I do is writing content, posting on my blog content that can help nurses in that space. So quite often when people write about resilience, they talk about nurses need to be stronger or you need to practice mindfulness. What they don't do is actually describe what, what, what can I do, Eva Story, yeah. to help myself in this situation. Mm. So... A lot of what I'm doing is writing about that, educating, talking to people to say, you know, you're not on your own. Because mm. that's the other thing, trying to get people to talk about how they're feeling is not always easy either. Because there's yeah. this culture of, if I say how I'm really feeling, then my colleagues will think I'm a crap manager and I'm not doing very well at my job. So there's a reluctance yeah, yeah, yeah. to do that. Particularly in, a, in, a, in an industry where, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Get on with it. Yeah. So it's education around that that process mm. is a safe process. So coaching is confidential. It's a space where you can come and you can talk about the issues you want to talk about and where you want to get to and how can I help you as a coach get to there. So it's it's a really valuable experience. And that's really where my passion comes from in wanting nurses to access that. Having accessed mm. it myself, which was, it was life-changing for me. Yes. It really was life-changing. Wanting other people to have that opportunity. Particularly nurses. Yeah, particularly yeah. nurses, because there isn't really anything out there that's doing that. There are a few people globally, not many, and it's hugely important and there's a really well-known coach called Ben Croft and I follow a lot of what he posts and he talks about making more of the world coachable mm. and that's the kind of the thing with coaching it's sometimes perhaps made available to people who already have a lot of skills and access to development more so than perhaps this group of people who don't so how do you make coaching accessible hmm. to that group and there's the key part like you said is, is becoming more coachable yeah and yeah. it's really funny that you should say that because um in the car today i was listening to a 15 minute podcast by a guy called russell brunson and he was talking about and he does a lot of coaching in marketing space but he's talking about the coachability of people mm. and he talked about the different phases of you know it can be quite blunt it can be quite confronting mm. and it gets quite emotional and then it then you get to this key point of you either end up saying to your coach right oh, yeah, sod you i know better and you walk off or you get to the point of going oh you know i've actually paid for this service i really should just mm. listen because someone can see something i can't quite see and um yeah becoming coachable mm. must be a challenge particularly again in such a greenfield environment but also again something else i was listening to today was talking just about that actually saying there is this notion that people have to be coachable to be coached mm. whereas actually the, the people who may be deemed as uncoachable are probably the ones that need coaching the most mm. and that's the challenge so if we talk about if we come out of health and yeah. talk about the corporate world yes the changes in, you know, they call it VUCA, don't they? They're volatile, uncertain. I can't remember what the other yeah. ones stand for now. But, you know, if if 
we want people to be able to um, develop and, and thrive in a world that's very different because it's changing, then you need different skills. Mm. And to be able to work across organisations, it requires a different mindset. So maybe those people who have perhaps been labelled uncoachable actually are the very ones that we need to be looking at as, and I'm not saying nurses are uncoachable, don't, don't no, get no, me no. wrong, but there is that debate to be had because mm. it can make such a difference. And coming back to that, you know, how you have a difficult conversation with somebody, if someone's being coached, what, what you're doing is you're giving them insight. They're finding their insight into themselves. They're learning about themselves in order to be able to develop Hmm. and achieve the goal so yeah yeah. interesting subject it is it is because yeah (laughs) then you get into the whole world of free will and you know you've got to let people off if they continue to be uncoachable that's their thing it's 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 funny because i think the other thing i've picked up is that if people have been sent to coaching then that's a kind of a resistance to what yes. I've been sent so I don't want to go there I used to have that when I was a corporate trainer back in the day oh, yeah. Yeah, I've been sent on this course yeah. but then when you have people who are elected to come on the course yeah. they're keen as mustard yeah yeah. But those who are sent it's like oh yeah my manager told me I've got to bloody come here and yeah. they're the ones who would always you know a three day course yeah. morning two morning three turn up stinking a piss because yeah. they were like oh let's get out because we're on a jolly yeah. from work yeah yeah hmm <laughs> So where, where are things at now and where are they going? Well, I'm continuing to work with, I work with nurses on a one-to-one basis so people can approach me. That's mm. how I find people. I don't tend to heavily market. Um, I'd rather people either come to me or if I have a conversation with somebody and I'll say, how can I help you? Is there something I can help you with? Are you interested in being coached um, or for somebody to be referred to me mm. who's experienced coaching? So I kind of, I'm growing this slowly and incrementally, mm. um, writing about kind of... So informing that space. Sorry. Informing yeah, that yeah, space. Because at part of this, I think there needs to be a debate and a discussion about resilience in nursing more than there has been. So part of my um, vision, if you like, is to be able to stimulate discussion and debate and think about ways, creative ways. How can, how can we mm. challenge this? Because it's not going to go away. No. You know, healthcare is struggling for lots and lots of reasons, aging population, aging workforce, increasing costs. So the challenges in health are going to rise. Mm. They're not going to get any less. And it, the question Plus it doesn't strike me as an easy job. It isn't an easy job. And so, it? no. you know, it's do I want to become a nurse or do I want to become something that's less intensive yeah. and higher paying? Yeah. You know. And for a nurse manager or a midwife manager, for that point you know that that role has changed so much Mm. in terms of the level of managerial responsibility now and very very little time to spend actually on the floor observing you know the shadowing the developing because there's so much emphasis on the nuts and bolts if you like of managing the throughput of patients managing your FTE on awards, efficiencies, savings has been very much a focus. And, and not just here globally because of the rising mm. costs, but that brings its own challenges because people came into nursing to nurse. And look after and care for Yeah. People. And for some people, that that role has changed dramatically. Mm. And, and further and further yeah, away from the coal yeah. face. And yet you still need nurses, you know, that essence of nursing is hugely important to patient care because if you don't have that and that's another debate for another time but you know there's the whole artificial intelligence you can't you can't ever replace that caring and that eyes and ears of a nurse on a ward that picks things up and actually does something with that Mm. that's the part of the role that's irreplaceable 100% because 
at the point you need some nursing help is the point you're not at your strongest, as I said in the intro. And that's when AI is not going to cut it. That's when you, you know, when you've had a, let's just say a significant injury or illness, Mm. that's when all the bullshit of Mm. life disappears. (laughs) And you actually get to see the real essence of a person and you're there to look after them. And there is a role. I think there is a role for AI, but not that takes away from nursing. I think there are some components of AI that could actually free up nurses time to do more of that. Oh yeah. Which which patient's gonna go yeah. where on the ward yeah. and this yeah. and that Absolutely. and all of that like, make decisions do 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 Yeah, hundred percent. But you know when you talk about or oh, I've heard people talk about AI AI and nursing, you can almost see the dollar signs and the savings, you know, rolling round oh, well actually yeah. you're there's still, an accountancy thing, yeah. you know. Oh, yeah. we could bring this system in. Yeah. There's that and there's that yeah. and the other. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like um, it would be like me trying to develop an AI system to interview guests. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to work. No. It's not something that interests me. No. <laughs> so, um, what have you learned about yourself in this little journey? Well, it's my, not a little journey, in it's my a journey. Yeah. Um, I've learned a lot about myself actually. I think probably the biggest thing is that you I've learned that I'm stronger than I ever thought I was. Mm. So, you know, lots of the life things that I've gone through, lots of the kind of upping sticks and living in a different country and that for me has I think highlighted that actually I'm stronger than I think I am and that anything is possible if you put your mind to it and that we can talk ourselves out of anything if we want to but and into and into yeah but actually to change the way you think about something and to use a coaching term reframe it can actually take your life forward in ways that you may not have ever imagined I don't ever regret anything I've done I think no 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 I think everything that I've done has led me to who I am now so even all the crappy stuff that you know goes on in life I think I have taken away something from that and applied it to who I am now and it also helps me to relate to other people. I think it, having been through various things, you can relate to someone else who's been in that. And compassion and empathy are hugely important. Mm. And things that sometimes get lost in the humdrum and the busyness. And just to be able to recognise that in someone else and just offer to be there for that person just to listen to them is something that gets lost yeah mm. it must be hugely uh, meaningful and rewarding now absolutely absolutely I you know I think coaching sometimes gets a bad name because there's lots of people doing coaching but I think if you taught to do coaching and you've gone through a course that you A, learn a lot about yourself. Yes. And it's hugely rewarding because you see other people develop and things that they thought weren't possible, you hear and see them doing. And I just love that. I just think that's what it's about. You know, when I coach a nurse who says, I don't have the experience and I can see this person and I can hear that experience that that person has and then fast forward six months and this person tells me hey I've done this this and this and I would never have done that I would never have even considered it and I think that's what it's about Mm. for me that person having tapped into their capabilities and going forward rather than keeping themselves back and never achieving and always wondering yes is what it's about for me so what does the next three to five years look like <laughs> who knows who knows <laughs> no the next three to five years 
I would like to have made a difference to the whole resilience in nursing mm. debate and hopefully have provided people with tools and knowledge that they can apply so mm. that they don't end up falling into a hole like I fell into because I think there's value in that for them there's mm. value in that for organisations if you look at the um, absenteeism rates amongst nursing it's really high not yeah. just in if Australia you look at those, those key indicators yeah. of absenteeism days yeah. away from work due to stress yeah. turnover yeah. Uh, lack of productivity yeah. And we need to, the bottom line, you know, we need to be able to care for our staff, not just pay that lip service. We Mm. actually need to be able to demonstrate what sets this organisation apart from another organisation, I think, in the future will be how you care and support your staff. And that's something that's been missing often. Mm. And then the flow on to the patient. Yeah, yeah. Mm. It's almost that. It strikes me as um, I I had a podcast guest Amanda Lambros who talked about relationships and how as you know, it's incumbent upon each individual within a relationship to look after themselves to bring the best mm-hmm. of the relationship. You know, it's all, it strikes me as super incumbent upon nurses listening to mm-hmm. you to to develop expand reveal mm. the greatness that's in them mm. and their resilience not just for the betterment of themselves but also the people that they absolutely. care about the patients absolutely mm. what does eva do to keep herself grounded in, <laughs> in the routine and how does that differ from when you were a nurse um that was one of the things i was super keen to ask you i i think it does differ for me now than from when i was nursing so i was guilty of doing the long hours and mm. checking emails at home and being that workaholically addictive yeah person. yeah and that's that came from a place of i guess passion for the role mm. um but equally i think now i can see you know i, I work for myself so i don't have that stress as such i don't have that fast pace of life and I know that a lot of people do and I'm very fortunate not not to have that but for me it's the awareness about you know literally just I'll go and walk the dog that's my time that keeps me grounded that's my thinking time and that people might listen to that and think you know but actually Mm, a lot of people would go with that it's space to think and think things through and mm. work things through in my head and that for me is my time where I you know it keeps me grounded gives me the time to think and what next and where am I going and what do I need to tweak and that's and I think that plus the balance for family family mm. is important particularly you now I've got grandchildren and having the flexibility to do something I love but still be able to keep those connections is yeah. massively important. Mm. But, mm. Yeah. And I think, you know, lots of people find themselves or will find themselves in the same shoes I was in with their jobs going in restructures and Yeah. You know, if, if I mean, what does the future of nursing look like to you, I can um, that's a really good question. I think the future of nursing is going to be fast paced. There's going to be less resources. So there's more work, less mm. resources. Um, more patients. More patients. I think finding the time for what we've talked about today, self care, is, you know, huge. Hugely challenging, interestingly, something I was reading this week around um, organisations that expect their staff to come in early and stay late. And there's some ruling that I was reading in, I think, I don't know if it's, I think it's Australia, not just Perth, that, you know, people are going to have to be paid for that. 
it's not acceptable anymore and I think the landscape is changing because it's not just in health even in the corporate world you know that being a coach I'm reading a lot of things outside of health and I'm yeah. seeing almost that shift in wellness and looking after employees and no longer is it the KPIs around how many clients and how many hours it's it's about working smarter but also being healthy in that mm. space and I think that whole what what worked once is people are recognizing is what's burnt people out so there's got to be a shift in that and I would like to see that shift happen in nursing mm. because I think it's a tough gig it's a tough tough job nursing no doubt you know and they're I think the rates of um, suicide in nursing is creeping up mm. and mental health issues. So, it, And that's a correlation to stress and environment mm. and pressures and challenges. So anything that can be done that helps nurses in that space, because we need, we'll always need nurses. Nurses... You know, it's a job that's not going to go yeah, away. No, absolutely. But the Doctors, downside... nurses, if, undertakers... Yeah, but if we don't if we don't pay attention to that what will happen is we won't attract nurses yeah. into the profession because mm. you know particularly some of the younger generations are very definite about what they want in a career now in nursing and people won't stay and then that creates a whole issue in itself because you have an aging population so with an aging population there's a higher demand in healthcare so you then have a mismatch with you don't have the numbers coming into nursing in the same way but you've got mm. more demand so scary prospect yeah. one of the last questions that I like to ask my guest is um, taking what we're talking about taking some of your thinking learning wisdom if you could upload a single nugget into the collective consciousness so everybody got it in particular nurses but everybody <laughs> what would that be a single nugget. I think the well, the most important thing is what we've touched on. Really, is that to look after yourself because if you don't, then you can't be the best nurse that you want to be for the patients that you care for and nurses go into nursing for that reason to make a difference and self-care isn't indulgent self-care is mm. a necessity to be a good nurse is I think probably the most important message mm. more than one nugget <laughs> <laughs> One nugget. Right, uh, it's been awesome talking to you today. Oh, Very thank well. you. If people want to find you, where can they find you? They can find me um, via my website, evastory.com, and it's got all my contact details on there. So <clears> if there is anybody listening who would like to give coaching a will, get in touch with me. And what I say to people is, we'll have a session and see how you go see where it goes yeah yeah so no pressure but mm. if you've never been coached and you would like to try it just get in touch indeed thank you so much that's for your time all right today. thank you thank you <laughs>